Hey, what's the shakes? Our automotive enthusiast friends that are uh, all over the different spots you can be on planet Earth. (laughs) 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 Yes, you're regretting doing it, but you hit the play button on yet another... Kevin, another aleatory episode of V8 Radio. Of course it is. Absolutely. I was just thinking how aleatory uh, my breakfast was this morning. (laughs) Is that right? Well, that's great. Because aleatory means depending on the throw of the dice or chance. This is what happened. (laughs) (laughs) I opened the cabinet and I said, which cereal is it going to be? What's it going to be today? Right on. Aleatory. Well, like all those different places you could be listening from on planet Earth. Exactly. Very random. All makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the V8 Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined, as always, by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cubal clark Yes, sir, and it's it's been a hot minute since we did one of these. Yeah, well, we, we got uh, we got on a pretty tight frequency there for a while. Yeah, we did. N- now we're like back to the average. Yeah. But it just feels like a long time. It does. But uh, we're here to solve all that right now. Let's do it. And what well, do we do first, Kev? Well, you know, it's been a hot minute, but I, if I remember correctly, we launch every episode of V8 Radio with a saying? A limerick? No, it's an <laughs> automotive <laughs> trivia question. Yeah, right. You got that loaded up? I don't, unfortunately. I won the category anyway. You did. Did you prepare a trivia question for this episode? I certainly did. I certainly did. So here we go. All right, Kevin, in the early morning of June 4th, 1896, Mr. Henry Ford made his first trial run in a small four-wheeled vehicle he called what? Ooh. Ooh, a small four-wheeled vehicle that he called what? What? Well, you know, knowing that uh, Henry Ford was a... uh, I would say a world-class tinkerer, but probably the world-classest tinkerer, especially at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, uh, many people don't realize, but he was into bicycles first. Mm. He, uh, him and his, I want to say a, a member of his family, maybe his brother or something. And they got the wild hair in their posterior one day to attach an engine to something that they had created in their Dearborn Michigan garage, is that where it was? Dearborn? I don't know. What do I know? I don't know either. Barely uh, know how to get a trivia question out. <laughs> <laughs> and I think in order to have it not tip over, they needed to throw a couple extra wheels on this thing. Mm-hmm. So it went from a bicycle to a quadricycle. Ooh, that sounds neat. Doesn't it sound neat? It sounds a great name for a band. <laughs> quadricycle? Qu- quadricycle. <laughs> it could be describing the, uh, the seasons of... Uh, of the earth. It could be. It's a quadricycle. It, it is. You're absolutely spot on with that. And I think in the Midwest, we have all quadricycles in one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, pretty much. Oh, boy. So that's going to be my guess. It is the uh, uh, a vehicle that he called the quadricycle. Kevin says quadricycle. Duly noted. Right on. Right about the same time that your uh, Duryea boys were out... <laughs> <laughs> Barnstorming. <laughs> I was this close I to unleashing my final Deere question. <laughs> it's, uh, it's still in the in my back pocket. Yeah, we'll sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. So, what do you got for me? I got one for you. Also in the uh, the Ford genre. Ooh. This goes back quite a while, early days of hot rodding. I've had a lot of that stuff on my mind recently with uh, things. Mm-hmm. There was a term they used to use on a, uh, a flathead that was modified. The question is, what is a 3 8 by 3 8 flathead? Ooh, what is a 3 8 by 3 8 flathead? Mm-hmm. Oh boy. Okay. So well, let's think about this. And that was a term for a modified flathead. Yes. There's your. There's your clue. Okay. Um. 
let's see here. So, what would what would people do to modify the hot rod these flatheads? Um, pos- throw a bigger cam in them. Mm. Um, maybe shave the heads down. Mm. Get a little more compression out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Three eighths by three eighths. Oh gosh, it's probably just staring at me right in the face and i can't even see it um you got an old flatty in your face that's pretty cool yeah well that's how i roll baby (laughs) (laughs) uh what is a three eighths by three eighths flathead um Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay so that is oh man (laughs) three eighths by three eighths yeah that is okay I'm going to say that that um, this is way off, of course, but I'm going to say that signifies a, um, a square bore, a square bore and stroke combination. Signifies a square bore and stroke yeah. combination. How we arrived at that, Lord only knows. Well, I mean, that's something that certainly has two measurements that, you know, you would... Yeah throw out there i guess duly noted yes yeah, so maybe three and three eighths square uh stroke by three and three eighths bore yeah interesting could be could be not <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll find out at the end of the show ladies and gentlemen right on boy is it gonna be exciting <laughs> i can't wait can, can, can we get there now <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier that uh, it's been a few minutes since we did one of these shows. And interestingly, like time has been on like ultra high speed during that short period of time. Yep. So fast, I might add, that you were able to completely remove the engine from the GTO, tinker with it, and put it back in and drive the car again I in was. the short span. I mean, that's that, a record. It is a huge record for this kid, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, I had an oil leak and uh, we... I uh, thought it was the rear main leaking. Uh, you, you know how Pontiacs are pretty notorious for rear main seal leaks. And we just thought that the seal I put in there just wasn't up to up to, up to to the task. So I bought another rear main, um, got it, and I wanted to replace the oil pump too for a, a higher pressure unit. And um, so we, I went to my buddy Randy's house, who's been an integral part in the, in the recreation of this GTO. And uh, I got there early Saturday morning, and we had the. I got there at eight o'clock, and we had that engine out by ten thirty that morning. And nice. Yeah, it was great, and we took it apart. We realized that it wasn't the rear main that was leaking. However, it was uh-huh. the it was the uh, rear uh, rear of the oil pan was leaking. So that said, we. Just resealed it up. We used some bright stuff to uh, to seal up the oil pan gasket, which was a, a one piece uh, unit, so it was reusable. And we could see when we pulled the pan off that um, on that rear arch, uh, it was wet, so it was letting oil get past it immediately. But the so, back of the motor was dry. Correct. The back of the motor was dry. So that's a great feeling. It really is because I wasn't looking forward to replacing yeah. that rear main so yeah, that's tricky even out of the car that's tricky because you you might install it and everything seems like it went just fine like right. it did last time exactly but then all of a sudden it's leaking and then you go oh man so yeah. that's good so yeah we resealed up that oil pan and um got it all back together and we had it back we had the engine back in the car that same day uh we also um now when you uh examined the oil pan was there any any obvious reason for the leak was something distorted or it's it's an old pan it's an i think it's an original pan to that engine and it's been it's been through a few uh few has a few miles on it so Mm -hmm. i just think between it and it just didn't seal up nice against that um that rear arch that rear that rear um rear pan gasket so like i said we put some right stuff on it glued it all together on both sides and uh i could run it without oil pan bolts and it would stay together and it wouldn't leak. nice yeah Yeah, that right stuff is serious it it really is it's great stuff (laughs) literally 
Well, great stuff's the expanding foam. That's true. Is. That's true. It's great, great stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a, you know, it's funny. There are so many specialized automotive sealants and and uh, chemicals and glues and adhesives and and sealers and gaskets mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't. You know, they, they kind of just grab something off the shelf and right. spray spray it on and clamp it down and say, "Here we go." Here we go. There is an entire. Uh, you you could have an entire university on using the proper sealants. And you really can. And, well, yeah, because some are they dry aerobically, some are anaerobic, some are catalyzed, some are oil resistant, some yes. are for fuel, some mm-hmm. are for temperature, some are you know like different types of Loctites and exactly. different gaskets for you know again the same type of criteria and uh, it's always fun to me to see people you know you see a lot of the YouTube certified mechanics <laughs> that just kind of grab whatever. And, and glue it up but you know with with right stuff you almost kind of can yeah you, you really you really can <laughs> it, it, it's great it's amazing stuff and randy turned me onto that and he uses that in all of his engines that he builds and he says dude i never get a leak with that for anything when i when i put an engine together with this stuff yeah so. yeah you, you gotta mean it but you know for fun reading one day Get your hands on a copy of the fell pro gasket manual mm-hmm. they used to do a pocket guide it was like you know pocket size mm-hmm and uh, it gave you the instructions on how to install every type of gasket and seal. Oh, no kidding. Under the Felt Pro umbrella, which, right you know, on. of course, would probably work with any of them. And you'd be surprised, man. There's, you got to know what you're doing. Yes. And gasket technology and sealer technology has gotten to the point where it's so forgiving that, you know, you probably got an 80% chance of getting it right just doing it. Mm. Um, yeah. So, anyway, it's good that you, uh, you got that going. So the car. Went back together that night. You stayed the night at stayed a hotel. The and then the next morning, we kind of, because of the where I mounted the rear coil, um, one of the connections from the wire harness that goes down to the transmission for the rear kickdown wasn't long enough. So we extended that wire. And we, uh, earlier you mentioned Loctite, and I realized the, the importance of using Loctite because there was a few bolts that were loose mm-hmm. that we had tightened up that we didn't use Loctite on that we did this time around. Like, Do you uh, remember what they were threaded the, into? The motor mount bolts that, oh. were, that connected the motor mount to the block. They were loose. Okay, interesting. And yeah. those those are kind of spooky because it's, it's generally like a grade 5 or grade 8 bolt mm-hmm. into a cast iron block. Yeah, and these so you don't were, want to, um, um, uh, ARP bolts that we used. Okay, so together. they're wave locks or whatever they are, yeah. high high tensile strength bolts. Mm-hmm. But for those to work right, you got to stretch them, you got to torque them, and nobody likes to stretch and torque bolts going into cast iron. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he uses a lift plate uh, as well to, to, to pull the engine out on the intake manifold, and that always makes me a little queasy when I see yeah. that. And because cast it, iron is it's super strong, but it, it's just knowing what the repair is going to be if yeah you have a problem yeah and it was a full the fully dressed engine all the 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 pumps were on it everything was on it when we pulled it out so seven it's probably six it's at least six fifty yeah yeah on there with four bolts holding onto the carb mount yeah four bolts that said did they say made in China on them or are they good bolts no, no they were actually, <laughs> they were ARP bolts as well well there you go you don't have to worry yeah. about the bolts yeah. Um. So you did you you did you Loctite those back in? The darn right I did. Yes. Do you remember which Loctite you used? Um. I believe we used red. The I red. Guess. Yeah. Uh. Interesting. So I don't know the spec off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. But now that you and you, of course, not to get ahead of the story, but you got the car back together and drove it. Correct. Yeah, we got it back together. It got everything dialed in on Sunday. Started it up. You know, got coolant in there. Changed the oil. Um, and you know, got got all the air pockets out, got everything put back together, um, and just and got it running again, and you know, test drove it and all that good stuff. Um, by uh, so I was out of there. I was driving home by three o'clock Sunday afternoon. Nice. Yeah, it what was a great little fast weekend. Great turnaround. I loved it. it made me really really happy. Yeah, when, I, when sure. I'm left to do something, man, it would still be out of the engine. The engine would still be out of the car, rather. Well, you know, distractions and all. Yeah, right, right, right. You already did the detail stuff that you, 
you know, yes. probably normally would have done. I mean, if I pulled the engine out of my rib, I couldn't get it back in on a weekend because I'd be trying to clean everything up and paint yeah. everything. And so that was already done. So it's good. Yeah. Well, we did notice a few oil leaks as well that kind of perturbed me a little bit. Um, it's hard. To t- it looked like something coming out of the out of the valley pan bolts. It looked like there some oil was kind of emanating mm. out of there. Um, the rear of the heads looked like a little bit of oil was seeping down. I mean, nothing bad, but just enough to annoy you mm-hmm. so i mean did not, you not enough re- to make a drip or anything did you feel the need to retorque the heads i didn't retorque the heads probably should have but i, I would have added another couple days to your weekend yeah it could have you never know <laughs> <laughs> well those you know pontiac valve covers are also that's if true they're, if they're stamped they're a little tricky to get to seal also yeah yeah that's true that's a good point so yeah. now that you've uh, drove the car home, mm-hmm. did you see an improvement in your oil pressure gauge that you wanted to see? Um, yes and no. Uh, cold oil pressure, absolutely. It's it's probably it's probably too high. It's it's around ninety pounds. That's pretty high. Yeah, when it's high, when it's when it's cold, after everything is fully hot and fully heat soaked, the pressure is still not where I want it to be at idle. It's where is still, it? It's like 10 that's 10 idle hot in gear that is 10 idle idle hot in gear yes all right what's your idle rpm 600 and that's where it is that's where it's supposed to be and that's where it is yes 10's not bad i know but i want i want at least 20 just to make you feel better and once again what oil are you running in this it's a 15 w30 uh from renegade Aha. Uh-huh. And is this still the first oil for the motor? No, 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 no. You that changed it. That changed it, yes. That's what, what I'm running now. It was like a, a comp cam's breaking oil is what it 1530. was. 1530. Yes. Interesting viscosity. Yeah, that's that's what I was told to run, so that's what I ran. Aha. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was the source? Uh, my boy, Randy. Randy. Mm-hmm. Well, Randy, you know, Randy. he's a smart guy, so yeah. there's... There's got to be some logic there. My, my thought would be, I mean, so 15, of course, is the the cold viscosity. Mm-hmm. And then the the 30 is going to be the warm. And if it warm, you're at 10 PSI. I, I would imagine if you put like a 1540 in it, you might have a couple of more PSI. Mm. And the 15 is a little bit harder to spin than a 10. Correct. But that's neither here nor there in this car. So, right. But you know, today's oil is it's a lot better than the old stuff was. And uh, as far as your 10 psi, you know the golden rule: the 10 psi per thousand RPM. So, oh, you're, you're ahead of that. I guess I'm there then. And and that they even say is kind of nonsense too. I mean, generally, from what I understand, and I'm not an oil oil titian. <laughs> an oilologist uh, yes uh, oilologist Mm -hmm. Uh, the general theory these days is run the lowest viscosity you can Mm -hmm. and still have a happy engine because you know and i see it all the time these guys run 2050 in their in their race motors you know you gotta put a 2050 in a race motor and especially like a sportsman or a weekend drag racer They'll dump 2050 in an engine that's got super tight tolerances and never gets up to operating temperature, and they're just stirring that, yeah. stirring that mess of thick, heavy oil like that right. is is murder on your your oil pump drive and mm-hmm. you know everything else. They're trying to push uh, you know molasses through these tiny crevices <laughs> crevices in your engine. Where you look at all the modern cars, you know they're talking O twenties and yeah. Well, uh, mine, mine uh, Jenny's Santa Fe is a five thirty. Yeah, run, right. So is my yeah. Suburban is a five thirty. Yeah, and that's the reason for it. You know, yeah. to uh, reduce that residual residual uh, friction now those engines are designed to run that exactly their yes. tolerances and specs and everything else but the 1530 uh, next go around i might um, or you could you know you could do the old bottle of stp mm. which is yep. nothing but goodness man is that right 
Oh, it's awesome. If you look at like uh, ZDDP additive products, uh-huh. your blue bottle of STP is like, that's what it is. It's just loaded with it. Uh. And it's cheap and it's uh, it's a high viscosity, you know, it's like molasses again. But it, sure. you heat it up and it blends with the oil and uh, it, you might show a little bit of an increase there. Okay. If you really need to, I don't think you need to though. Okay. Then I won't. But then again, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running 1040 in the Riv. Okay. Does that have and an oil gauge? Yes. I put one on. And what, what does it look like? I don't know. It's under the hood. Really? <laughs> Why? So I've, I've never seen it driving. <laughs> <laughs> I only put it on there when I rebuilt the timing cover and, and put a new oil pump in it just to make sure that I had pressure. Oh, I got gotcha. you. And then I just closed the hood. All right. And it's fine. If I, if I put a gauge in the car, mm-hmm. I'll have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I should remove that gauge then. There we there go. There you go. It's like there the deer go. crossing sign. You know, you move the deer crossing sign, the deer won't cross <laughs> the deer there anymore. Go. Yeah, exactly. And then problem solved. Mm-hmm. Very so good. the reason uh, why I was asking about the color of your Loctite, those have a temperature range, and oh. heat heat releases it. Is that so, right? So yeah. So I don't know what the red temperature range is. You can mm-hmm. easily Google it and find out. But you might want to peek on the side of your block and see if you see any red drippies coming out of your oh, okay motor mount bolts because then they they got warm enough to release. Hmm. I was not aware of that. Mm-hmm. That's how you. That's literally if you if you can if you have an assembly that you can put a even a little pro, you know handheld propane torch on, you can uh, uh, rather than fight a red Loctite bolt, just heat it up and spin it right on. Oh, I'll be darned. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. We got all kinds of knowledge on this show today, man. Man, we are just hitting it. It was a heck of a roll of the dice for this show. You, uh, right? <laughs> I, I, I would say the word if I remembered it. It's aleatory. It's very aleatory. Yeah. Overall, <laughs> you just happen to ask all the questions that I think I know the answers to. <laughs> right on. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, but the one thing that I was kind of bummed about is uh, forever the the kick down hasn't worked in that car because it's never been hooked up so we got it hooked up we verified that uh the kick down switch works uh i get 12 volts when you when you floor the uh, car because it's an electric kick down not like a mechanical one like a a turbo 350 would have and we hooked it up and it still doesn't kick down so i picked up yeah so i picked up a uh a solenoid a kick down solenoid and uh one of these days, I'm going to actually replace that and see what we can't do. One of these days when you find yourself on your back under the car with the trans pan off. Yes, exactly. And I need to do that anyway because the trans pan is still leaking. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's a leak. We didn't touch that because our, our focus was the, the oil leak, which, by the way, is fixed. Well, that's good news. Yeah. Well, that's a win. So I only have one color fluid under the car now instead of multicolor fluid. Right. <laughs> Multi-vis, if you yeah, will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that was a fun project. I enjoyed it. But now the car is running like garbage. I drove it yesterday, and uh, or Sunday, yeah, Sunday, and it's running like absolute, like a missing turd. Really? Yeah. And it's, I'm really kind of bummed out about it, too. All right. Describe to me the uh, missing turd syndrome here. It's, it's the whole engine kind of... It's almost like it's missing, like on three cylinders, because it's just it feels out of balance. Uh, it won't rev super high. Um, you got your plug wires on, right? Yeah, I mean, when I drove it home, it was it was primo. When I drove it from Randy's, it was great. Mm-hmm. And then I hadn't touched it since then, and I, I drove to I helped a buddy of mine move, who happens to own a gold '67 GTO with a uh, black vinyl top, and. Um, Sounds so, like an interesting looking car. Oh, it's the best. Uh, so I <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like the best looking car. It's not bad, let me tell you. So I started the GTO up and I started driving it and it just didn't have any pickup and it felt like it was shuttering. And I tried to, I thought maybe the carb was loading up 
and it kind of seemed to clear up a bit, but not really. Uh, and then on the way back, and he only lives like two miles from, from where I live. So I, I didn't have a big problem driving it that far. And it was just doing the same thing driving home. So When's the last time you topped off the fuel tank? Um, when I went to Randy's. And it, so, was, it was at three quarters full. And I, I didn't put much gas in it. Uh-huh. We've been seeing um, reports, locally anyway, of uh, a particular gas station that was making people's cars run terribly. Really? Like two weeks ago. Hmm. And the only thing we've deduced is that there was a lot of moisture in that load. I got gotcha. you. Uh, so, could be a could be a thing. I don't know. Maybe and get yourself a bottle of fuel system start. dryer and throw it in there. Yeah, that's a good idea. I was just going to rule out uh, ignition, put a timing light on every spark plug uh, wire, and just verify it's firing. Um, look at the plugs to see what they're looking like. It didn't smell overly rich. The exhaust didn't anyway. Not that I noticed, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it sounds it's, bad fuel I mean, because if it drove home fine and you didn't yeah. change anything, the only thing I would say is that the weather was probably different, but was it that yeah. different? Yeah, I mean, it was cool uh, when I went to Randy's. It was hot yesterday. And it's super humid. Yeah, it is super humid. Yeah, so I'm not sure. It's... So there you go, trying to burn moisture again. Yeah. That, that humidity, it's what it does. It, yeah. You know, you can't burn water that's in the air. Doesn't, yeah, doesn't like true. it. That's true. That's true. I'd start as simple as you can. For sure. Yeah, I don't want to just go hog wild and, you know. Yeah. And, you know, start tearing things apart that I shouldn't tear apart and never right. put them I mean, back together again. You did just pull all the plug wires, so you might have made a connector unhappy or something. Maybe. Which could be, but I, I'd say a bottle of fuel system dryer, and uh, agitate it, and then top it off again with some, some good gas, some known quantity stuff. Yeah, you know, I just discovered that I can get ethanol free gas at uh, my local regional airport. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's ninety one octane, but um, without any ethanol, I should be able to run that. I mean, I'm running at what nine nine point three to one. Yeah, that, that thing engine. was built for that stuff. So. Yeah. So yeah, and it's it's about the same price as as regular gas is right yeah, now. Yeah, well, it's only uh, four hundred bucks an ounce, like yeah, like gold. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, all right. Well, that's good. So now we got you know another update that we'll look forward to to see uh, what what clears its throat. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I like I like your idea of the uh, fuel system dryer. I think I will get some of that. See what that does for us. It's easy. It is easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I guess by you too, by here near where we live, it went from springtime, cool, crisp mornings, mm. and then it just went bam right to <laughs> hot summer. Guess what, kids? It's summer today. It, well, really, the spring lasted a week, you know, and, and here we are. Which yeah. I'm not complaining about the weather. It. It blows when it comes up on you that fast because you don't you don't get a chance to physically get used to it. True, true. And you know the guys in the shop we're we're opening earlier and earlier to try and accommodate and make it you know cooler working hours and yeah. you know all the rest of the stuff. But uh, but it is nice to be you know kind of back in back in summer weather again. I do love the heat. I, I got to tell you, I it really it's my favorite of every yeah. season. I love the hot summer. Yeah, it's much better than uh, than cold. Mm-hmm. All day. I don't know why I still live in the north. Yeah, well, it's, it's your decision. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. So, one of my long term projects is slowly starting to come to a close, and that was the uh, the seat upgrade in the Galaxy. Oh, right. Which I started <clears throat> last year. Um, I don't know, August or so, mm-hmm. something like that. And I removed the. Uh, the stock, so it's a Galaxy 500 XL, which means it was factory buckets and console. And I removed the factory buckets because it was like literally sitting on a park bench. Oh, brother. And I had them restuffed with new covers 
a long time ago, and they were in great shape, but they they just they weren't terrible. But mm-hmm. it was time to time to get move something on. that yeah, and and actually more so for a little more adjustability because mm-hmm. you can't they didn't recline and they didn't you know right. And I'm convinced that people were shorter in the '60s. I, they, I think they were. Yeah, you, because you, you kind of kind of got that problem too in the GTO, right? Yeah. If my seat is the springs are weak, so I, I sit pretty low yeah. in there. And uh, I know if I if I stuffed if I re- had that seat restuffed or got a new seat frame, it would sit quite a bit higher in there. I don't know if I would like that though. I kind of right. like how it sits now, but. It's not super comfortable over a long period of time. Yeah, and that, that's kind of where I was too. The, the 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 stuffing was, you know, pretty robust. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had put in the uh, the tilt steering column with a different steering wheel, and the column length and the dish of the wheel were such that you were even closer to the steering wheel. Oh boy! So you know, I thought, all right, I'm going to do something about this. So mm-hmm. I ended up getting a set of those uh, Scat Pro Car low back black buckets nice. and i got them because they they've got articulated bolsters in the side and they recline and and uh they're a lightweight nice little seat and they have again they're low backs so they kind of fit the look and the pattern is pretty close to the original as far as the vinyl mm-hmm. and last year uh our buddy grady and i went down to the shop and made some conversion brackets to be able to attach the seat to our original seat tracks mm-hmm. And they were just kind of flat pieces of steel that made the holes connect. And I drove it home, and the seat was the seat was pretty solid. I, I kind of dig the seat, uh, except it was like way too high. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm I looking you at told the, me about that. You're like looking straight at the at the windshield cowl. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it seemed kind of goofy. I was kind of like I was driving the car like a tricycle. You know, you're kind of <laughs> sitting up high and reaching down to the controls. <laughs> So I re-engineered the seat adapter, the mid-bracket, if you will, to go from the seat to the track. Okay. And that was not an easy project. Is that right? No, it was because basically the, the dimension of the seat frame is such that if you ran a bolt through it right into the seat track, you, half the bolt would be on the track and the other half would be exposed. It splits oh. the middle of the bolt. Oh, wow. So you can't like drill a hole in it in the bracket and, you know... Huh. So that's out. So now you got to relocate the bolts. But by doing that, how do you make it so that you can move the bolts left or right and then make it be serviceable and make it so you can put it together and take it apart and not have a bunch of height in it? Because that's what I was trying to do is shorten this thing up. Right. So I ended up coming up with a design and, and it, uh, it took about two inches out of the seat overall height, oh, which is good. And uh, Mason, uh, uh, the fabricator that works in our shop, I, I I actually drew up some plans and I dropped them off in his workbench and he's been kind of whittling these things out and they're they're serious brackets they're seats you got to be safe you know you don't want these things right scrap metal falling out or something <laughs> sure so uh, just Friday he he finished the one side and you know tigged it all up and had to consider like the 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 adjustment arm needed a swing clearance to you know to be able to adjust the seat forward and back and by adding this extra material now the the retention springs for the latches are in the way we had to relocate all those good gravy yeah a simple thing that really turned into kind of a project and he he would shoot me a message on our internal chat thing and say can you come back here for a minute i go back there and he's scratching his head he's like are are you sure <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I think so. And then I look at it and I designed it and then I would get all confused. Oh, brother. Uh, but eventually it came together. So the, the passenger side's good. It's good to go. It's been tested. I dig it. So uh, I'm hoping tomorrow we might be able to get the driver's side done and then I'll be able to go enjoy this car out in the heat. Oh, yeah. Top Once down. Again. For sure. Very nice, dude. Yeah, it's it's fun to get these these kind of projects to wrap up. It's uh, it's been quite an odyssey for you on that one. Yes, and it that, it's silly. You think it's something you could do in, a, in an afternoon, right. you know? but just getting the time and and mm. figuring it out, and then you know trying to get. I was uh, there was so many nights where I was just going to go do it myself, 
and then at the end of the day, I'm smoked or I got to go somewhere, and it's like, right. yeah, no. And and um, Mason's a far better TIG welder than I am, so uh, <laughs> you know he, he made it look nice. So yeah, that's cool. And I drove the car into the shop the other day to uh, to be able to test the bracket in the floor, and um, of course made the long list of other things that I I need to change. <laughs> And it was kind of funny because it, it's a, it's a sign of progress when smaller things are noticeable. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, right. So I'm down to like a lot of little annoyances. Like, boy, the the throttle pedal is really stiff on this car. <laughs> I don't like was the it always sound that way. Did, did I did I did I not notice how stiff that was? So I'm gonna kind of either I, it's a cable. Uh, mm-hmm. I either have to lube the cable up or see what's going on with the spring. You know easy nothing thing but mm-hmm. it, it's i think it's cool that we're getting down to those kind of little revisions on yeah, stuff you can really of, really dial that those little fine minute details in the one thing i cannot stand on this car is the valve train noise oh i i understand that because mine's a clatterer too yeah and a lot of it is a function of being a roller lifter and a roller rocker with a roller tip and a roller fulcrum Mm-hmm. So you got all these bearings in there, and there's a little bit of play in each one of them. Yeah. And next thing you know, it's, it sounds like a sewing machine, and, and extra sound under under the hood doesn't do it. They're all adjusted properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you going to do about it? I don't know because on this car, and I think we've talked about this before too. This has been a long term problem, but these are bolt down rockers that they're shaft mount. I mean, they're not oh. shaft mount; they're pedestal mount. Okay. individuals so kind of like the pontiac you put them on the pedestal and torque them down and the adjusters on the tip on the push rod side mm-hmm. oh so, right so it's got a screw that goes through the end of the rocker tip so you can't adjust them while it's running you gotta sure set it and, and do it but one thing that always bothers me is if you don't tighten that rocker uh, uh retaining bolt and hold the rocker secure the rocker can pivot as you're tightening it down. It can. There's nothing like machined in the head to guide the rocker to point there's in the no right direction. Like, um, um, push rod guide. To keep things no. in place. Oh man! And it, it, even if there was a push rod guide, it, it really wouldn't matter because this is more the rocker arm. You know, there's there wouldn't be enough precision in a push rod guide. Okay. Right, but so the answer is a shaft mount rocker system. Oh which boy, they're out there. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jessel's got a really nice set. I bet he does. Yeah, I bet they, he does. Cost more than the first four cars I've owned, <laughs> um, but they're good to twelve thousand RPM or something crazy, oh. which this thing is never ever going to see. Well, then you're you're building in uh, longevity. Yeah, yeah. There's another brand that uh, I don't know a whole lot of. Out and it's U.S. design but made overseas, uh-huh. and by overseas I think I mean China, mm. which I, I don't dig normally. But sometimes today, unfortunately, you can't. Sometimes it's hard to get away from it's that stuff. Tough to get away from that. Yes. Um. So I'm researching to see, you know, and it's interesting because. Like our camper, my wife and I, we go camping. The camper's got a big sticker on the side that says, it's got a, an American flag, and you know, mm-hmm. and it says, in small print, assembled. And then underneath, in the USA. <laughs> so it was screwed together here, but it, you know everything else came from everywhere right. else. And that's kind of how these rockers are. And, and the website is like, all these American dudes in an American machine shop that are making stuff, but I think they're making the prototypes, and then the production oh, run happens the, somewhere the production else. The facility is and, offshore. And it, 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 yeah, so it comes back, and then things get put together here. And but they've been around a long time, and I, I don't know. Um, it stinks that uh, manufacturer facilities have to do that to stay in business because it is so much cheaper to manufacture things overseas it's hard to stay competitive if everything is in-house, which is a shame. And I, I hate that, that it's, it's like that. But unfortunately, it, yeah, that's the world we live in right now. It is. And I, I think there's a couple sides of that coin because one of them is that, is it is that 100% true? Will a company just not make it 
if they make it here, if that makes sense. I mean, it it depends on... Or, or is it just a bigger margin? It, it's Will possible. They, I mean, you're, you're right, because number one, we don't know what the R&D cost is. We don't know what the raw material cost is. Um, we, we don't know how much of that margin it would eat up if it was manufactured in-house or in the U.S. Um, in, if it if it does take up an, a, a huge chunk of that margin, is that enough to keep the company um, uh, making new things? And is it enough to you know keep everybody paid and and help grow the company, or is it enough just to kind of move it along? Right, right. That's so, the question. Yeah. You know. And then on the flip side, the, the concept of being able to remain competitive. There's a lot of companies that make a lot of stuff in this country that are competitive. That's true. And a lot of times it requires telling that brand story in such a manner that people appreciate what they're getting. And the I think the if you drew a you know an XY chart here, the opposite corner of that would be made here but also made super cheaply mm. with an expensive cost. So people were paying the premium, right. but still not getting the value. You know, so that that's the opposite extreme, right. and, and that happens too. Paying the premium, but not getting the premium. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I like the fact today <clears throat> that, uh, especially in the car part world and performance parts, mm-hmm. uh, generally by the, the the wide margin, anything that says made in the USA is is perceived to be a premium, a mm-hmm. premium product. You know. Yes. And and that's great. I love that. Um, but it does tend to make things expensive. Uh, I'm not saying it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. You look at Forge Line wheels; those are not cheap. No, they're worth it. Yeah, you know, they're great they, wheels. ARP fasteners, not cheap, mm-hmm. but worth it. Totally and worth it. Now you just got to figure out: does that fall within the range of what's needed for this project? Yeah. So my Galaxy, although. It would probably look pretty interesting on a set of forge lines. It doesn't need them, right. just from a specification standpoint. Mm-hmm. If I was going to go autocross this thing, it's a heavy enough car. Yeah, I'd save my pennies and I'd get some. Yeah, because I know the brand story. I know why those wheels are what they are. I know the difference between a cast off the shelf wheel and something that's designed to sustain the side loads and and all the rest right. of. That, that that those wheels are designed to do. So I get it. I don't know where that leaves me with my rocker arm situation. <laughs> <laughs> it's all just ma- call Jezel. <laughs> Maybe he'll cut you a deal. <laughs> nah, you know, but again, that's that's way beyond the scope of what this that's what true. this car that's needs. True. And and maybe I'm missing something too. There could be oh, you just need to shim it. Or mm-hmm. uh, and, and I've often thought about going backwards because everything is roller on this and doesn't need to be. Because like Windsor small block Ford Windsor engines that are f- built from the factory don't make a noise when it comes to rockers. And those are a ball cup base with yeah. a you know just stamped steel whatever. And and they yeah. made they made good power. You know. Yeah. Now, was that engine a roller engine when it was first manufactured? So it's a it's a Ford racing long block. So oh, this, okay. this was never in a, never in a, in a production, production car. Vehicle. Okay, but it's uh, it was not a roller cam. It was converted. I converted it to a okay. roller cam. It's got a cop cam swap okay. in it. These blocks are tapped for the spider that holds the lifters down. Yes. So the conversion's easy. You just buy the parts and throw it in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the rockers that it came with as part of the crate engine were roller fulcrum and roller tip, but they were not adjustable. You had to shim them. Oh, I see. Or change your push rod length. And then I wanted to go to the roller cam, so that had substantially shorter push rods, which yes. meant uh, I, I re you know I measured the. The push rods, I got those installed, and it, it clattered like crazy. So then I got the rockers that are on are really nice. They're comp cams rockers. They're mm-hmm. very nice product, but I, I just, it's loud. And if this was in a, you know, again, like a sportsman drag car, I wouldn't care. Right. Yeah. But it's in a 60 sled that's supposed to 
be low it's, and slow. Well, <laughs> it's not even low and slow, but it, in my world, this is an escape from all that noise and stuff. Mm. I, I don't need something to be annoying me and ticking. Because <laughs> that's why I'm driving this, because the rest of the world is annoying me and ticking. Yeah, it's ticking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. This is the uh, anti-annoyance vehicle. Yeah. Well, that rib doesn't... Um it doesn't make any noise, though, right? No. The, the, well, it's, it was built by Buick, you know, yeah. so it's, there's nothing that's changed on it internally outside of a couple of replacement parts and the carburetor, so there's no opportunity for that thing to make any noise. That's true. Yeah, it's a nice car. Thanks. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, got to drive that, uh, you know, recently again uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it... It does what it's supposed to do. I, I finally got my sway bars in. I got the front and rear. Oh, I mentioned that before. You got them in? Yeah. The, did I tell you that? No. Oh, the front one finally arrived. You said uh, the, I think the last time you, you the last thing you told me was November. Yeah, I ordered it in at the end of October, beginning of November, and it showed up like two weeks ago. Gee whiz! Showed up in May. Did you um, Did you get it put in? Not yet. No. Okay. No, so I have the rear one standing here. I got the front one in my office. I got to kind of re-engineer the rear mounts because I, I want to do them differently. Um, and look at a couple other things, but uh, that should be a one-day deal. Yeah, right. Is my anticipation on that. It's pretty bolt-on, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just laughing to myself because it ain't <laughs> going to be a one-day deal. <laughs> <laughs> come on come on man <laughs> well the part that's not going to be one day is the rear control arms uh because originally it, the design of this system is they use a plate and a and a hose clamp type looking thing it's a c clamp that goes around the sway bar which mounts to a plate which bolts to the arm because these cars never came with a rear bar right ever so adco makes the bar and it's a great bar but i think it might also fit something else and for them to these cars didn't have box control arms so they didn't right. really want to crush them by putting a big faster through so i have a design in my head to use a uh, like a d-shaped urethane bushing okay attached to the side of the control arm and blah 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 so it's going to take longer than i expect to make but um but it should be pretty solid when it's done i'm sure it will be yeah yeah that'll be cool i'm hoping so uh, your corners a bit, eh? You know, I, I'm not even, I'm not really that unhappy with the way it corners. Mm -hmm. What I don't like is just getting blown around on the highway. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. It kind of sways you a little bit when the wind hits you. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, the the alignment on these cars is horrible. They they really made the spindle. It doesn't have any caster in it in the factory design and. Oh, really? One of the things I'm going to try and do is redesign the lower front suspension and possibly the upper to try and put caster in it so that it does track straighter going on the road. Gotcha. Oh, speaking of alignments, I also found a whole set of alignment shims missing from my one of my control arms. Nice. And yeah. Great. <laughs> I'm like, that's probably why it's making such a bad noise when I, when I would back up. Was it... Uh, both like front and rear upper control no, arm the just front passenger uh pack was missing just yeah. completely gone yeah and wouldn't you, you know, know it randy happened to have a whole set of passenger labeled wrapped in tape front passenger alignment shims from his mike, el camino mike gto it said on it it, it should it <laughs> might as well have it might as well have i'm like you gotta be kidding me he's like no you're gonna have them <laughs> it's like that's great well, it's probably pretty there. close. Yeah, it probably is. It needs, I mean, it hasn't been aligned since I replaced all the suspension components in that car. Nice. Yeah. Well, well I'll tell you what, my tire, I do not have uneven wear on the front tires. Not not one bit. Uh-huh. So That's, they're both wearing out excessively at the same time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> But I mean, no. The, the the tread is still even across from fr from the inside to outside. I just checked it the other day. I'm like, I, I thought to myself, this is crazy how this car, the tires aren't just like completely just shredded after you, 100 uh, miles. You break out your your leaking head penny and stick it in the tread and yep. 
measure to his nose or you whatever. Got it. And see, yeah, nice. Well, uh, that's one way to look at a good alignment, I guess. <laughs> 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 Thank you for letting me keep the glass half full. <laughs> well, you know, you do what you got to do. I, I'm much more conditioned to uh, to alignments after we wrote the check for that alignment rack that we have at the shop. Oh, right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, which, you know, that's one of those things that with the frequency that we do alignments, um, we would have to do them for the next 150 years. Oh, boy. Uh, for that tool to... to uh, earn its keep but at the same time you do one and fix an old car and it's earned its keep you know just mm-hmm. not not That's measured true. in dollars it's measured in the car's performance you know mm-hmm. so the nuances there are pretty insane about little things and the effects but if a guy like you is happy and his tires aren't wearing out then yeah it's done i mean i i know i need to get it looked at and i know i need to get it done but it it drives straight down the road it doesn't pull it turns it it tracks it it doesn't drive bad yeah no i mean i, I drove it yeah. you know after you got the engine done the first time and mm-hmm. it seemed okay it didn't cause any alarms so yeah. that's cool yeah it's, i mean it's close because i i when i put i put new new uh tie rods on and i got them super close to what the originals were that i pulled mm-hmm. off and i used the same shim packs when i didn't have them missing Mm-hmm. That, um, when I replace the control arms and all that good stuff, so it's it's pretty close. Yep, I mean it has to be. Yeah, for sure. Right on. Ah oh, man. So um, I don't know if you saw the other day or yesterday on on the Facebook. I on my personal page, I, I posted the picture of that Toyota uh, SUV with the front license plate that said RPM Act. Yes, I did yeah. see that. Yeah, that was that pretty was pretty cool. cool. Yeah. So uh, we went to the air show. We went to the Spirit of St. Louis air show at um, Spirit Airfield in Chesterfield, Missouri. All right. Which is uh, just over there a little while. Yeah. And um, it was awesome. Was it? It was so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It was incredible. I love air shows, man. Oh, they're my favorite. Well, my experience with most air shows, again, growing up in the Chicago area, Chicago has the, the Chicago Air Show over Lake sure. Michigan, and right. you go to the beach, and you they do the air show kind of right over the top of you. Well, we never went to the beach. We would either be at somebody's place in one of the high rises or something, just watching out over the lakefront. Yeah, man. Watching everybody do their thing. Or back in the day, all those planes used to take off from the Glenview Naval Air Base, uh, in Glenview, Illinois, mm-hmm. yeah, and would fly downtown and do their thing and fl- and land back in Glenview because there's no airport right there, you know, right downtown. Well, there there was until Daly shut it down. You know, we had yeah. we had Mix Field. You had Mix Field, but they didn't do the whole air show off Mix Field, right? They they might have had a couple of small planes, you know, a couple of two tree, but you know, as far <laughs> as any of the bigger stuff and and you know, if the the Blue Angels were there, they were coming out of glenview but uh so we used to go to the we'd sit on the highway right in front of the airport and just watch everything take off and you know that's go great over. well today the glenview naval air station is the site of uh d'agostino's pizza and a strip mall and some condos <laughs> oh, got closed a long time ago uh and you know d'agostino's is great but mm-hmm. unfortunately we lost the base uh, but the other thing was that not going to the uh, the lakefront presentation by the the beach, we never got the announcer or got the music and got all the stuff that right. goes along with it. Right. You just got to see stuff flying around, not know what's happening. So this time, um, again, our buddy Grady got us uh, some really awesome seats, basically on the runway. Um, they had Freaking these reserve, Grady, man. reserve sections <laughs> where, you know, they had a tent and food and, you know, drinks and stuff and, and chairs set up out there right in front of a PA and, and you got the, got the experience. Yeah. Um, and it was funny because I was excited about going, uh, we got through the gates and walked in and the first thing that happened, they were giving Huey helicopter rides. <gasps> did yeah, you so take one? I did not take one. <sighs> But Kevin. the first experience I had was literally this Huey flying 
straight off the ground in front of me and just right over the top of my head. This giant two rotor mm. monster going by. I mean, I felt like I could have just reached up and grabbed it. And uh, I, I told the guy, I was like, okay, I'm good. We can get out of here. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was like, wow. Um, I think I was around one of those uh, as a kid at some army uh-huh. thing, but uh, nothing, you know, I, I didn't serve in combat with anything like that. Right. So, you know, and there's a little bit of a theme there, right? So we, we end up going into the, the air show. They got a static display. They've got, Chinook helicopters. They got Blackhawks. They've got um, they've got some transport planes. The Super Guppy was there. The oh, giant, really? Yeah, NASA labeled transport plane that they can open up and stick a pair of T thirty eight trainer planes inside. Nice. Or a section of a Saturn V rocket. This giant transport plane. You can walk through that. There's a couple of F 16s sitting there. There's a P fifty one Mustang sitting there. There's a uh, a Spitfire and a, a Mosquito, World War II era nice. fixed wing stuff, and we walk through and and get to the uh, get to the show. Well, the show opens with a bunch of vintage aircraft flying by, uh, a restored B twenty nine. Ooh, this that's giant special. It was this giant, polished. Beautiful B-29 named Doc. You can look it up on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes flying by. And what goes next, but uh, there was another version um, of that plane that was, uh, I think it was a Liberator, but it had a different tail on it, a single tail instead of the double. And it was a Navy version. It was Mm -hmm. for them. Followed by a B-17. Oh, man. And the B-17 bomber is... To me, it's one of the coolest planes for a oh, lot of reasons. For uh, sure. Yeah. So this is a World War II era bomber, you know, four four engine rotary. They had, uh, it's it, you know, and this story is going somewhere, by the way. Okay. Um, one of the things I always w- I thought was cool about the B-17 is when I was a kid, I was building model cars. And a friend of mine built model cars. But he got a model airplane for Christmas, and it was a B-17. And neither one of us knew anything about this. And the two of us put this thing together in his basement. And I'm like, this is really cool looking. Yeah. It's just a cool looking plane. I had no idea what it did, but it was just a cool looking plane. <laughs> so that the shape of that thing, you know, is designed in the 40s. It's got... You know, to use hot rod terms, it's got like a Duval windshield, got a split windshield. Yeah. And and the cabin almost looks chopped and it's got these great lines. I mean, it's just a sleek looking. Yeah. So whoever designed that also had a sense of style because a lot of these aircraft are purpose designed, but they don't, they don't look that cool. That thing, that thing looks killer. So it's flying by and and I'm, I'm losing it. You know, I'm like, this is just, this is unreal. I've never seen one in person and here it is flying around. Uh, the show goes on and then it's uh, so that Spitfire and that Mosquito are out doing aerobatics they had a guy with a Pitts special biplane stunt plane yeah those are uh, cool this dude is a world champion aerobatic pilot yeah. Skip Stewart is his name okay. Google him he, I, he, the plane shouldn't do what that thing did but it did it was crazy uh, and then they went on to some of the big dogs, you know. So they brought out a pair of F4s. They they had an old uh, F4U Corsair. So the World War II era. Oh. Uh, carrier based fixed wing with the, the inverted gull wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wings that were designed to not let the rotor hit the deck when they land and, you know, mm-hmm. with the, all that stuff. So they got, you know, the vintage stuff flies. And then here comes a, a couple of F15s. And they're flying around and, and doing their thing. And and uh, then they break out one of the new F-35s. Ooh. Now, I knew nothing about the F-35 program. And when I was in high school, I was reading Popular Science Magazine. And, you know, and it was always the military might of the latest, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, American war planes. And, and then they would have their sketches of the MiGs, you know, what do the Russians have, you know, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And 
by the time I kind of got out of it, it was F fifteen strike eagles, I guess, were yeah. the were the hot one. And this is like the time of the first uh you know, Top Gun film and Yep. You know, so there there's all that going on. Well, for whatever reason my life goes on, I kinda get away from aviation. I hear a few stories, you know, the F twenty two program and uh we have a customer who's actually a pilot of one of those. Oof. Um but the F thirty five I didn't know anything about. So interestingly, the announcer changes and it's uh a female announcer, and she said, all right, we're going to do some demos of the, the uh, I think it's a Lockheed Martin uh, aircraft, but it was an Air Force mm-hmm. official unit, and the pilot's a female also. And this thing comes winging by, and it has the ability to basically make a 90-degree turn and go perfectly vertical mm. like a rocket. Nice. Okay? Now, some of these other planes I mentioned, the 15s, the F-16s, yeah. they, they can go vertical, not like this. Right. <laughs> the 35 will keep going and going and going. It doesn't even care. It's yeah. just out of here. Yep. And eventually the uh, the Blue Angels uh, performed, and they've got F-18s, and they were doing you know vertical ascension aerobatic maneuvers and whatnot. But you can kind of tell. like The, the plane's like... It's running out of energy. It's yeah. working, yeah. yeah. The 35, no, just... That's gone. killer. I love it. It was killer. And and she's doing nine plus G turns mm. and just spinning this thing, you know, upside down, inverted, like almost 90 degree turns and, and these crazy maneuvers where it almost stalls to 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 change vectoring. And, and they're like, yeah, this really isn't anything that this thing can do. It's just what we show you people. <laughs> <laughs> So my mind was completely blown by that thing. I'm just like, this is just so unbelievable. And uh, Kelly was with us. And she's normally not, um, she never expressed any interest in aviation. She doesn't really like to fly and all that. Mm -hmm. And she looks at me and she goes, hey, do they sell those to the public? (laughs) (laughs) I said, I don't think so. Not yet. Yet. I don't think there's a surplus quite yet. I think they're about 91 million bucks a crack at this point. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I'm looking around at this whole air show experience and, and seeing the evolution of all these aircraft and, and uh, you know, my fascination with their abilities and mm-hmm. the technical prowess. And, and that F-35 is known as a fifth generation fighter. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, if I understand correctly, that means a bunch of things. But one of the things it means is they can, they can basically network those in the sky Holy so they cow. communicate with each other. And I think like a commander can pilot multiple aircraft at once. That's trippy. Essentially to go into formation. And I could be wrong on that, but that's kind of what I picked up. So then it started to dawn on me of the genesis of all of these aircraft, you know. So so here we are at this bright sunny day it's a picnic atmosphere people are drinking eating there's happy music playing and these planes are flying around everyone's going "Ooh, wow (laughs) but these really have one purpose yep (laughs) yes they do they got one purpose they these are here to uh to prevent harm to come to you and i Mm -hmm. via by inflicting great harm to those who would seek to harm us (laughs) well yeah there you go it's that Mm -hmm. simple you know and in every country, the wheel, everything's got the same. Everybody's got the same stuff as far as strategy. Not everybody has F-35s, although they're selling them everywhere now. But mm-hmm. uh, And it kind of cast a strange shadow on the day because I'm like, you know, yeah. the great lengths that we go to to push the envelope for that reason. Right? Yeah. And then I thought... Is this is this a ruse? You know, when the Blue Angels all land and they're standing there in their blue suits, do they turn to each other and go, uh, "Yeah, we got them fooled." You know, we're, <laughs> we're showing them the happy stuff in the sky, but in reality, you know. And then I, I thought that can't be true, right? So then uh, we went home and I I watched the uh, the movie Memphis Bell, which is a yes. story of a B seventeen crew in World War Two. And I'd seen that a long time ago. I didn't pay a lot of attention. But the story is uh, these guys leave uh, uh, an airstrip in England. They fly across the English Channel. They go 
bomb Germany and this it's going to take out this plane plant that's making mm-hmm. aircraft and fly back. Well, the 17 has a tail gunner. It's got a turret gunner on the top. It's got a turret on the bottom, belly gunner. It's got a, a nose guy. It's got two side gunners mm-hmm. plus the bomb payload. I mean, it's a rocking machine. Oh, yeah. And that's all it was built for. Yeah, man. A lot and of destruction. It was built. Pure, that's it. Mm-hmm. So, and and it almost seems like the armament and the <laughs> the self def- self defense capabilities were like an add on. It's just like we need to get something that flies this far at this speed, carries this many bombs, and then it's like, hey, this thing's gonna be a sitting duck in the sky. So, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, put some guns on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I read that I think they made twelve thousand and change B seventeens. Wow! Holy cow! That's a lot. Yeah, like forty six or forty eight hundred of them got shot down. Jeez! Half of the B seventeen crew members didn't come back. Half. Really did not. So now I'm looking at this plane like I thought this thing was so cool, mm. and now I'm kind of creeped out by it. Really? Well, not creeped out. I don't know if this is the right way, but I'm looking at it differently. I'm looking sure. at it like... Like, oh, I have yeah, a, that's what this is for. Well, it was a complete new respect mm-hmm. for the fact that that one was sitting in front of me because I think there's only a couple of them left that are still flying. Right. And and uh, I, I was looking at the, the liner notes, if you will, of the uh, Memphis Bell film. There was six airworthy B-17s when they made that film. And they wrecked one of them oh, making snap. the film. They destroyed one in France. So that's great. That is great. Uh, but, you know, there was, so there was never like the luxury transport version. You know, there was, there was never somebody no. who owned one to make a private, you know. No, no this nope. is one thing only. And mm-hmm. and the fact that they, it was pivotal in, in, in the American World War II effort that was for the greater good of the whole the whole world you know without that thing everything could have been different but so then i had to rewind the whole experience in my mind and uh if you're still awake and listening this, i'm sorry for my therapy session here but i gotta get this out <laughs> uh where i end up landing is so that gal that was flying that f-35 uh-huh. was loving the hell out of it sure there's no way that she was not enjoying that day no. or all of the Blue Angel pilots or no. the guy flying the, the 17 or flying the Spitfire, any of that stuff. And I think today, maybe it's a little more of we build these awesome machines and people get to fly them. If the fit hits the shan, then they go to work. There you go, yeah. But training for the work... Is really pretty awesome. Yes, yes. I, I, also, I think um, another side benefit, if you will, of having these amazing, extremely lethal machines flying is they do act as one heck of a deterrent to those who would otherwise feel entitled to try to encroach upon U.S. liberties. And if, if you say... If you say, holy cow, they have a, a few squadrons of these F-35s, we don't stand a chance against that. Let's not do anything at all. And well, that, sure. That's part of it. And, and another, another point you made where, where you, you said that, uh, you know, maybe these Blue Angel pilots are, you know, you know when they get off their, out of the plane, they're snickering at each other like, hey, we got them fooled. I, I don't think you're that far off the mark when you say that because – those demonstration teams are for marketing. They are to get the public behind the military. So that is, in, in fact, part of the reason why they, why they have those, is to kind of keep public support sure. for, for the military. So Yeah, it's a PR thing, for sure. Yeah, all day. But I can't help but think, you know, watching the Memphis Bell film, which isn't a documentary, but it's based in reality to a degree mm-hmm. anyway. If you are from Germany... That story has a different ending. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> when when the Memphis Bell B-17 lands back in England and everybody cheers, if you're on the other side, you're not cheering. <laughs> no. No, you're not. You're and shaking just, your fist. It's this perspective, you know, mm-hmm. of, of where you stand and... I fully believe in the American ideal that life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, Mm -hmm. all men are created equal, that's gold. The problem, as I've, I learned a phrase from my old man, people are the problem. (laughs) (laughs) Because implementing that ideal is Uh is a challenge because people screw things up. They don't treat each other equally. They 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 don't. don't. Allow they get in the way of the pursuit of happiness, and and they don't provide liberty or life to everybody as they should. If everybody just did what they were supposed to do and respected each other, we wouldn't have F thirty fives or need them. Right. And but we do. We do, and they're awesome. Yeah. Oh my god, they're, it's incredible. But anyway, that that that's where I went in my air show experience. Uh, it, it certainly uh, um, enhanced and and flared up a, a large feeling of, of uh, you know, pride in our, our troops and our abilities and the companies that make this stuff with a little side order of, hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't yeah. know. But also, <laughs> speaking of the Memphis Bell, there's a, uh, besides the movie, there's a good book, um, which is called The Man Who Flew the Memphis Bell. Which is the autobiography of, uh, of Colonel Bob Morgan, who was the pilot of the Memphis Bell, who flew all those missions. It's a really good read if uh, if you're so inclined to get the non Hollywood version of what happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll check that out because you know, again, always been a huge fan of the space program and respect people like General Chuck Yeager who mm-hmm. pushed the limits. Uh, I walked away from that uh, air show grateful that i had seen something i never saw before and didn't think i could see nice watching that aircraft do what it did it just i've never seen anything like that in person mm-hmm. i was like this is incredible so that experience was was really really awesome next time take that huey ride <laughs> well I, I hope they do the show again next year they they canceled mm-hmm. it because of the the covid's right uh past couple of years but um i'm we want to open it up to our whole team. I would love to have our whole shop crew go out and mm-hmm. spend the day because uh, we have, you know, of course, our our, uh, our crew guy Sarge who flew on, uh, you know, C one thirties. C one thirties, yeah, he's loadmaster. Yes, and and that, you know, so the the transport cargo plane for the Blue Angels is a one thirty. Yes, it is. Fat Albert. Who knows Fat yeah. Albert, and, and that was there, and you know, it was, it was cool. So it I is, think it was a lot of fun. Did it have his Jado rockets on it? They didn't use them. They didn't have it. Oh, man. Come on, Albert. We were all looking forward to that. So the this this transport plane has bolt-on jets, basically, rockets that, yeah. that help it launch on a shorter airstrip mm-hmm. and get out of the get out of the hole. And um, there was a big rumble. There's Albert. Does he have the Jados in? Yeah. Didn't didn't have them. But. Have you ever seen any videos of him taking off with those rockets on? That thing nearly does go vertical. It's incredible. <laughs> It is yeah. absolutely incredible. Well, uh, Sarge did our shot. We were talking about this today because I came in with my whole head of sunburn, uh, except the little mm-hmm. raccoon thing from my sunglasses because I was staring up in the sky all weekend looking at this air show. And Sarge's like, oh, did you have fun at the air show? And I said, yeah, and we are talking about all the same stuff. And uh, uh, I said I was very impressed with the agility of that big 130 transporter the fat Albert plane. He's like, oh, yes, sir. They, uh, they, they, can, they can do some stuff. Mm-hmm. He said one time... I don't remember what part of the world they were in, but they were getting one delivered. And the uh, civilian pilot that was dropping this plane off, before he released it, decided to go take it for a couple of exhibition passes. Mm-hmm. And he's doing a couple of higher G turns and, you know, just kind of winging this thing around. He comes down and lands it. And the CO got insanely mad and said, that airframe will never be straight again. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you bent this thing on day one, and now we've got a bent airplane because doing what you just did to that thing is going to leave a mark. <laughs> they, uh, a C-130 actually landed on an aircraft carrier once in the 60s. You ever see those videos? I saw. I think I saw a picture of that. Yeah. Um, 
buddy of mine who's a personal trainer, one of his clients was a retired Air Force pilot. He told us about that. And we, I thought he was, you know, full of beans. So I Googled it and I found some video. And sure enough, they, I mean, this thing was stripped and it had no weight to it. But it, sure. it landed on that deck and they put that carrier into the wind and it took back off. Wow. It's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess, um, I'm taking stock and the enthusiasm for the cool stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, just, just digging all that side of it. It's too awesome. It is too awesome. It's been a while since I've been to a real uh, cool air show. I think the last one I went to that had static displays and all that good stuff was the uh, Cleveland Air Show that they have every year at uh, Burke mm-hmm. Lakefront Airport. It's, they have an airport kind of like Mixfield Field was, but it's right on the lake, right outside the outside of the downtown area. And they, they everything flies out of there. You can go on the tarmac and you know see some really cool planes hanging around there. It's a it's a pretty cool deal. I got to get back to one of those. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah. And the Angels, this was their 22nd show this year already. Really? That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And then the show factor is insane, too, because those guys are doing all this crazy stuff in the sky. But their announcer is standing there in the, in the blue suit with the hat on. Mm-hmm. And he's got his microphone, and he's calling all the shots of what they're doing in the sky. Mm-hmm. And he's looking at the crowd. He doesn't even look back. He doesn't look up. He doesn't look oh. behind him. He's standing basically at attention the whole time, raises the microphone to his mouth, says a few things, puts the microphone back down, looks straight ahead. They do the maneuver overhead. <laughs> it is timed just super precision. Mm. Ah, it's amazing. It's a military precision. I love it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Whole new appreciation for that. So it was cool. That's yeah, cool. It's uh, he he's certainly no seldom seen slim from Bonneville, but uh, I think he did all right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Referring to our uh, latest released Bonneville Up to Speed podcast, who as a guest we had the uh, one of the the trackside announcers for the Bonneville Speed Week, Mister Seldom Seen Slim. That was a good episode. <laughs> I loved it. He's, uh, he's he's quite a character. Yeah. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> Got a, a bunch of good ones coming out on that. <laughs> right on, right on. But you know what else is right on? I have an idea. Well, if it's the answer to our trivia questions, you had the right idea. Baboom! All right, so yeah, let's 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 wrap this up here. All right, Kevin. So I asked you uh, in the early morning of June fourth, eighteen ninety six, Henry Ford made his first trial run in a small four wheeled vehicle called what? And you regaled us with a, a cool story about how Henry Ford uh, was in, into bicycles for a time, and he put a couple of them together and called it a quadricycle. And that is correct, sir. It hey. was a quadricycle. Nice. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. You betcha. So my question to you was, uh, what was a 3 eighths by 3 eighths flathead? And yeah. uh, the classical 3 eighths by 3 eighths flathead means... You board a three eighths or a three and three sixteenths block out to three and three eighths. So Shut that's one. the hell up. And you uh, you stroked it with a, a mercury crank that was bigger uh, by about three eighths over the uh, uh, the Ford. Actually, it was a four and an eighth versus ah, the Ford three man. and three quarters. So it wasn't that the, the, they both ended in three eighths, but right. you you increased the size. If you did both, um, that was the. The full house flat had at 296 cubic inches. Okay. Uh, to really make a hot rod. But uh, but mm. there you go. So you, you know. I, t- you, I tap I danced think, around it. I think you got it. Oh, all right then. I'll take it. Fantastic. Right on. Thank you, sir. Well played. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Well, this was a good episode. It uh, tangented quite a bit, but okay. hopefully <laughs> everybody was able to hang on for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> right on. It was a good uh, it, ride. It was. It was different. We went We went straight vertical, and we never stopped. We did. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with hot rides that fly. That's true. For crying out loud. Mm. So if you get bored, jump online, check out uh, some of those F-35 ride-along videos. Um, I don't think there is. Yeah, I think there might be some where they're in, in, in cockpit. It's still pretty classified. They didn't let you get right up next to that one. Oh, is that right? Okay. But today with, with the gimbals and with a lot of the GoPro stuff, if you haven't checked out cockpit video recently, um, it's insane. Really? 
Yeah, there's just so much. Well, you just, we both just saw the Top Gun film. Yes, sir. Woo wee. That was great. Um, there was a, it was a lot of fun. If you haven't seen that, go see it. Yeah, it was a great movie. I loved it. <laughs> loved it. <Yeah. laughs> All righty. Well, this has been the V8 Radio Podcast. Uh, I'm Kevin Oste, thanking you for uh, for sitting with us and tuning in for uh, an extended episode today. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to have my therapy session here. Uh, if you like this kind of stuff, hit the subscribe button. And uh, wherever you receive your podcasts, a new one will magically appear either on your device or in your email box. It's magic. Magic. That's right. So uh, for Mr. Mike Cuball clark I'm Kevin Oste reminding you to uh, hammer down and go straight up. Straight up, baby. <laughs> and we'll talk to you next time on VA Radio.